Today's live stream is brought to you by Cyberry.it. Make sure you guys check out the link in the description below and check out some of the best IT training that you guys can possibly get out on the internet today. Use the coupon code ITCQ50 to save 50% off of your premium membership. Yo, what's going on YouTube? This is Zach with IT Career Questions and I have over here Ken Underhill with Cyberry. Welcome, Ken. How are you doing today? star now that I'm uh now that I'm on your YouTube channels. Awesome, man. I, I'm super stoked to have you here and you've I think you've been a star for quite some time now. You're uh you're <laughs> very popular on social media and I think you're one of the most popular cyber instructors over there. I hear uh, uh, many great yeah. things about you. So <laughs> nice, it's nice. It's a pleasure to have you on here. So Sweet. Yeah. Um now I uh uh do you mind if we start with the quiz I wanted to have for you, Zach? Yeah, that's fine. You can you can go <laughs> and right, do whatever right. you want. So so I kind of sprung this on Zach right before we jumped on the call here, or right before we went, uh, went live. Uh, so my quiz, uh, I generally eat healthy. I, I'm a pretty healthy eater. Um, however, today I ate some cookies. So the reward here, if Zach guesses right, he'll have three guesses, um, and he'll win one shiny dollar. Uh, there it is right there. It's real. It's a real dollar. Um, I will mail that to him uh, if he's successful. Now, He's going to get three guesses to figure out what kind of cookies I ate. Now, I'm going to be nice um, and not make you get, get like the specific type of cookie and brand and all that good stuff. It's really just like the general, if you can get like one component of it, um, and that's a hint. If you can get one component of it, then you'll win the dollar. All right. So, what kind of cookie you ate? Yes. Yeah, so you'll have three guesses, and I'll tell you if you're correct um, all right. or not. Um, so. <laughs> Oatmeal raisin. Wrong. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. <laughs> um, vanilla wafer. Wrong again, man. Got one shot. Make it count. Make it sh make it count. I, I feel like my last guess would be like way too obvious. I I'm gonna go like completely like off the board here. Um, man. Chocolate macadamia. Ooh. No. No. But I'll. I'll. I'll you're going to, you're going to win because I, as I mentioned, uh, one, com you just have to get one component of, of what I had. So I actually had, uh, I guess it's new. Um, it's, it's, I'll give it to you with the chocolate bar. So it's basically like a fudge dipped nutter butter. Um, had never seen that before. Uh, it's not that good, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so if you're wondering out there, like, should I buy that now? Is that the cookie that he endorses? It is not. Um, but, uh, so congratulations, Zach. I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you. Um, so you can either get this shiny dollar mailed to you or I'll, uh, I'll donate like 20 bucks to your charity of choice or whatever. So um, we'll, we'll figure that out later. Awesome. Cool. Definitely. Cool, man. So, well, I, that sucks that I didn't really guess it, but <laughs> close you, enough, you, you, you know, had me close worried. Enough. I'm like, God, what kind of quiz is he going to have for me today? You <laughs> had me really worried it, here. You know what? At least it wasn't like a 400 question, you know, quiz or anything like that. So um, we, yeah. we kept it easy today, I think. That's good. Thank goodness. So, so what are we doing today, Zach? I, we're we're kind of we banter back and forth a bit on social media and stuff like that. Like, what? Yeah. So, what do you want to do today? Well, you're what, the what expert here. You, you are the expert. You are you hold oh, boy. The, the, the CHFI and the CEH. And I would love if you could talk a little bit more specifically first about the CHFI because, from my understanding, that is quite a difficult certification. So, let's <laughs> let's talk about that. Let, I want to hear about this one. Yeah, so um, so it's a beast um, is, is kind of how I describe it. Um, the, the challenge with that exam is not so much of like, you've got to have a lot of hands-on forensics. Um, it's more so that you've got to remember like very minute details as we kind of talked about earlier uh, on like page 1056 of the official material. There's like one little sentence and you get like 10 questions off that. So um, it's, it's challenging in that aspect. There's just so much material um, to take. And about the exam itself, for people that aren't familiar with that, it's from EC Council, uh, that certification. It's a 150 question exam. So, you know, in comparison to like a CompTIA, you know, like kind of a standard CompTIA exam, it's like pretty much double what you would generally see out there on most exams. Um, you know, you've got things like CISP and stuff that are a lot more in depth, but it's a pretty, I, I, like I said, I call it a beast. It's it's pretty in depth exam from that standpoint. Um, I like to equate it to kind of like a, like a muddy lake. Right. And there's a lot of fish in that lake and you've got to know about every single one of those fish, but 
the difference between that and like a CEH is with the CHFI, you have to know like kind of in depth on every single fish, you know, whereas like the CEH is the same, it's that same, you know, like big muddy pond or whatever with a lot of fish, but you kind of know them all at a high level and just a couple of them like NMAP or something, you know, you have to know more in depth. So um, that's kind of the comparison between those exams. Uh, CHFI itself covers like all things kind of forensic related um, from digital forensics, computer forensics. Uh, so you, you deep dive into some things like master boot record, you know, the boot process for Linux, Mac, Windows. Um, but most of that is like deep diving in the study itself and not on the actual exam. It's kind of, it's like a weird exam. Like you, you really have no idea what's going to be on it. So you kind of have to study, like, as I mentioned, like thousands of pages of stuff and uh, hope for the best. How long did you take to study for that specific exam? Uh, I, I took a month initially. I actually failed it my first time. Um, I changed some answers and I think I failed about like just one or two questions the first time around. Um, and uh, then I had a very narrow window to pass it in. So I basically had two weeks. Um, th this was part of my uh, master's program. It was built into it. So um, if I didn't want to pay for the exam myself, I, I basically had a two week window to schedule it again, pass it, you know, and go through all that process and, and you know, again, hope for the best. Um, so I, I studied like crazy some more, um, just based off the first time I took the exam, kind of focused on some things and, uh, came back and passed it. Uh, it wasn't pretty. Um, I didn't get like some, you know, 98% and, you know, all these things that some people strive for. Uh, but to me, a pass is a pass on a certification exam. Um, and it's really just about like, can you actually do the skills hands-on once you're out there in the industry? Yeah. I think a pass is a pass is a pass and any way you look at it, right? <laughs> no, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> That's a victory all the time. <laughs> exactly. So how, how do you compare that, you know, with like the CEH, you know, uh, I, they're obviously two different exams, but as mm -hmm. far as difficulty level, you know, where would you place those? Yeah, I actually felt it was, uh, it, I felt it was a lot more difficult than CEH. And I fortunately took the CEH first. Um, and I think that helped me a lot with the CHFI, you know, as far as like the attacks and that sort of stuff that were mentioned, um, you know, and from the, you know, the flip side of it, of the, um, but understanding attacks, understand how they work, understand the hacker methodology, you know, the mentality and stuff like that, that was really beneficial to kind of set me up for passing the exam. You know, of course I had to study and everything like that, but I think the CEH, in my opinion, was a lot easier than CHFI. Uh, so, so I'm like monitoring chat just a little bit here, trying to sure. pay attention. And uh, somebody asked where you're working right now. Um, so we, I, I did kind of fail to have like a yeah, proper yeah. introduction on who you are. So sure. if you want to- Yeah, so there's this really- Who um, you are and your history yeah. a little bit. Yeah, there's this tiny little, uh, this tiny little startup um, that some people in the security community have heard about, you know, maybe for a few years or so uh, called Cybrary. Um, and so over there, I'm the master instructor. Um, and I've got a couple of courses with, you know, just a few students uh, enrolled in them is all. Um, you know, a couple of people were like, oh, he's cool. Let me, let me enroll. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kidding there, but yeah, I, I work for cyber as a master instructor, um, and, uh, analytics with the analytics, I'm, I'm like the top instructor on the site right now. Um, so pretty popular, I guess, um, so popular you, enough you, to get on Zach's channel and that's all that matters. No, 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 no. Well, when you say tiny, I mean, you guys, I, I think are hitting milestones now, right? I mean, you guys are, are really yeah, hitting so, big numbers. Yeah, now. over, over 2 million users, yeah. um, on the platform, um, you know, good, uh, helping a lot of people get jobs and stuff like that. A lot of people that are going um, through like the, uh, the insider pro membership and going on the career tracks, uh, they're coming out to like some people work their, you know, work themselves really hard for a couple months and were able to uh, land a job. Um, some people takes a little longer. Just, it's just really about the effort that you put into it and to your learning and getting the skills. And then from there you can potentially get jobs on it. Yeah. I, I like, you know, specifically where cyber differs from, other platforms. I mean, you guys are really geared towards cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you right. guys really focus down that path right there and, and really try to help people who are looking to, to take that path of or, or career path in their own lives. So, uh, I mean, I salute you guys for doing that. You guys are doing a fantastic job of it. And, and I just posted a video earlier this week where I talked about that and you know, the, the feedback that I see on social media that you guys get is just phenomenal you know you don't see that all the time so um i love that i love that I, yeah. and i imagine that you get tons of great feedback being you know the the top instructor over there so 
Yeah, what, much, you know, much of the feedback is, you know, if if you were cool like Zach, I'd be I'd be more interested in your course. I'm like, oh, yeah. come on, you know, what, what can I do? Uh, if for those that don't know, Zach and I go back and forth on uh, LinkedIn a lot. Yeah, we we, we like to banter and yeah, yeah. we uh, <laughs> I think we troll each other quite often, which is yeah, it's kind of fun. I, I honestly, get a kick that's out of it. Uh, well, that was actually one of the requirements um, for the cyber role uh, <laughs> in the job description. It said, "Can you troll Zach successfully?" And I was like, "I can do this. I can perfect. I can make that happen." <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Um, but yeah, we, we do get a lot of feedback. I get a lot of students that'll tag me on, on like LinkedIn um, or send me messages like, hey, you know, I'm, this course has helped me a lot. Um, and it's really good to get that. You know, it's really good to get that feedback. It lets you know you're doing something right. Um, and if you're doing something wrong, people share that too and, and let you improve. So um, I think that's one of the key things of being an instructor and sharing with the community in any capacity is being willing to take that feedback, whether positive or negative, and uh, adjusting however you need to to make it better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going back to the, the CHFI, um, I, I would love for you to give some advice to people if they're looking to take that. What are some key notes that people could take or key technologies and things that people people could be looking into studying if they're looking to go down that path? Sure. Um, from my experience on it, I wouldn't worry about understanding like, like let's just say a tool like NCASE, for example, for forensics. Um, I wouldn't worry about like how to specifically like click through in case and, and do whatever. I would just be more familiar with like kind of the things that like a specific tool can do. So like if I want to, you know, like get data from, you know, your laptop or something like that, what are some of the common tools that I could use to do that? Um, you won't see, a, or I can't, I can't, I can't say that. I can't say what you'll see on the exam. Um, but you, you shouldn't see like, it's not like Nmap, like on the CEH, where you like have to know certain commands and be able to, you know, like you really have to get some hands-on to understand the commands. So when you get a question on that, you know, you can answer that appropriately. The CHFI differs in that aspect regarding tools because it's more of like a very high-level type of questioning regarding the tool, like what's it kind of used for, versus like you really need to like deep dive into this, you know, set of tools or whatever. Um, so kind of the best advice I would give number one is make sure you actually want to take it. Don't take it just because I'm mentioning it. Mentioning it, um, you know, EC Council exams, you know, certification exams are pricey for most people, anyways. So make sure that it's something you want to actually take. There's like other forensic exams out there you can take, um, and I can't think of any off the top of my head besides like the end case uh, forensic examiner thing. Uh, but there's a lot of different ones out there, and so make sure number one is an exam you actually want to take, um, and if you do want to take it, study wise, uh, focus on their official material. Um, and then, of course, you know, to take my cyber course, I, I kind of break down a lot of things. So not to self-plug, but I'm going to self-plug just because I find it beneficial for people. Um, but I've got a, a forensics course on cyber that really is focused on helping you pass the CHFI. Um, so with that course, I share like the notes I used to study and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I definitely recommend that if you're going to study for it, that'll kind of help you narrow down your focus a little bit. Um, so that way, when you're using like your the EC Council official material, you can be like, okay, well, these are my weak areas. Let me go study this instead of, oh, look, I've got, you know, like 1,500 pages to look through. I can't read all this and you just give up. Focus on like the areas you're weak on. And that's what my free course will do for you. Let you kind of focus on the areas you're like, I don't really know about this. And you can go research a little more on your own. Um, now, exam day, my biggest tip is don't change answers like I did on my, uh, on my first attempt there. I think that's why I failed the first time. So don't change answers unless you're 100% certain. Like you can argue with yourself basically and say, you know what, I was wrong the first answer I chose and this this other one is the correct answer or whatever. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. You get four hours for the exam. The other um, suggestion for exam day is go through all the questions first. So like go through and you can always mark them to come back and look at them later. So just go through all the questions, make sure you answer everything, like put some answer in there. And then the ones you're not sure on, just mark it for review, go back to it. Um, that's what I did. It took me about two, about two hours or so to um, kind of go through all the questions, and then I went back to the ones I wasn't sure on, and had you know I had a couple hours left to to debate myself through those. So um, those are kind of the exam day tips. Like I said, specific tools. There's nothing. There's nothing in general. Just kind of go off basic forensic stuff. You know, practice acquiring data off your laptop or your desktop or whatever. Um, practice USB forensics a little bit. Practice like researching your email. Um, practice looking at social media accounts and figuring out what kind of information you can pull from those. Uh, so just really a lot of basic stuff that people could probably think common sense wise, um, but just kind of getting familiar with the overall forensic process 
And that mindset is going to help you a lot on the exam. Awesome. That's great advice, man. I appreciate that. I, I think the viewers out there appreciate that as well. Absolutely. You're a rock star. <laughs> uh, that's, that, that must be like somebody that I paid to, to, to say that. So <laughs> thank, thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> oh, of course. Um, so what about the CEH? You know, um, what kind of advice would you have as far as um, studying for that? You know, I mean, obviously go to Cybrary to sure, study sure. the yeah. courses there, but what are some of the key technologies and things um, for the CEH that you think really stand out? Yeah, so that one's a little easier to, to, to kind of talk about like specific uh, technologies. So definitely Nmap, like if you don't know Nmap, if I say Nmap and you have no clue, learn it. Um, specifically for CEH and then also if you actually want to be a penetration tester, because I've spoken to a lot of students uh, on both sides of the fence, right? Like some people are strictly like, I want to be a pen tester, so that's why I'm going through this. And other people are like, I just want to kind of know the knowledge. I want to think like an attacker. And so they take the, you know, the course or the training or the certification for that reason. So um, Nmap, Kali Linux, um, understanding things like Wireshark, uh, even Snort, understanding you know IDSs, uh, intrusion detection systems for those viewers that don't know like what that is. Um, I think those are probably kind of the main uh, tools. And then um, without plugging Cybery all the time in this, uh, in this uh, interview here, um, Bre the Breaking Stuff with Joe series. So if you search for BSWJ in the catalog, uh, Joe Perry, our director of research, has a lot of uh, like mini tool courses. Um, and a lot of those are around, you know, like things like John the Ripper, which is a password cracker. Um, you know, he, he goes over like Nmaps and some other ones that uh, you can use for penetration testing in general. So I think if your goal is to like be a pen tester, then you definitely need to look at his series. You need to look at things like Kali Linux on the site and map course um, to get all that kind of foundational knowledge for you to practice more hands on. Um, the CEH exam itself, you definitely want to practice stuff hands on. You could you could like read a book and study and, you know, and then go pass it. Um, but I think to really be successful at the exam, you need to do some hands on. Um, and for a lot of people, that's NMAP, Wireshark, that sort of stuff. What are some of like the foundations of, of the CEH? You know, what what do you what should you be looking at prior, you know, to to going sure, yeah. to that level, right? So uh, yeah, because everybody wants to be a hacker because they see yeah. it on the media and movies and stuff like that. Um, number one, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and Joe Perry could tell you they could talk for hours on all the paperwork and okay. you know meeting with lawyers and all that fun fun stuff that we don't find fun. Um, but the foundation of knowledge is what you need. So things like Linux, you definitely have to know Linux, Linux at the command line. Um, that's probably one of the biggest uh, factors. And then understanding other OSs as well, like Windows, uh, even Mac to some capacity will, will help you uh, as a pen tester. Understanding web attacks, you know, or specifically websites, vulnerabilities, understanding like coding will help you. You don't have to be like a, a software engineer or anything, but just understanding like, how uh, like an engineer would come in and solve a problem with code. And then from there, as you're like looking at code, like Ruby, Python, Bash, you know, uh, PowerShell scripts, whatever, you can understand that stuff and like, okay, this is what they were trying to do with this particular application. And now I can figure out how to attack that application because I've been able to look at this code. So again, coding is not required. I know several pen testers that have no clue on like any programming language or any scripting language or anything like that. Um, and they're very good pen testers, right? But they just run like some tools and kind of do it automated and that sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of debate. We could go on that aspect of it, but foundational wise, I think number one, Linux, you have to have Linux. You have to understand how operating systems function, file structures. You have to understand basic things like, you know, email, how communication works, you know, basic networking, TCP IP, uh, you know, OSI model, understand the TCP three-way handshake. Um, that's one of the biggest things you'll actually probably see on the CEH exam, uh, tested in some capacity, is talking about the communication between client and server and how that can be attacked. You know, so how, how we can attack that communication stream. So, you know, your basic, um, I would say your basic IT slash basic security knowledge, you know, so maybe some knowledge about like viruses, malware, um, in general, um, and that can even just be familiar with it from like media, you know, or like different articles you read and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be like an actual course on it. Um, but all that stuff is going to be basically little little puzzle pieces that will help you get a better puzzle, you know, a, a more complete puzzle picture. And then you can go into like CEH or any type of, 
you know, other penetration testing exams, so like pen test plus, um, as an example for something else that's kind of on the, the similar level. Is there a specific coding language that you would suggest learning first? There's a question yeah. in the uh, chat. Yeah, yeah, Python. Python, Python, without a doubt. Python is the number one like cybersecurity related scripting language that most people are, are using. Um, it's very powerful. Um, and a lot of big companies that you may want to get a job at are using Python in some capacity. So yeah, Python is, is number one. It's also one of the easiest ones to learn besides like Ruby. So I, I recommend that one. Um, and plugging Cyberry again. Um, <laughs> We have courses on Python on, on Cyber, so for free. So. Awesome. Well, I think all the courses are free, right? Yeah, yeah. All, all the video training is free. Um, if you want, like, to access, like, the labs, you know, that's kind of part of the paid model, um, which is definitely worth it. It makes your life a lot easier. You don't have to set up all these different VMs to do things. They're, like, all there right. for you already. So um, definitely worth it if it's in your budget. And the practice test. You get access to the practice test, yeah. right, yeah. which is yeah. practice phenomenal. Practice test assessment. So capture the flags. Um, that sort of stuff as well. So yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff, um, and uh, and eventually we'll try to convince uh, like Joe to sign autographs as part of that paid model. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still working on that. So that's not an official thing yet, but uh, we'll we'll see if we can get him doing that. The paid picture autographs, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. it's got to be. It, awesome. it has to be. It has I love to be. it. I love yeah. it. That'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to add before we uh, kick it over to like a open question format? Um, you know, I just think that um, one of the things that I, I've been teaching online for several years before I came uh, with Cyber, just various courses, business, whatever. Um, and one of the things that I've kind of noticed over the years is a lot of people will doubt themselves and give up. And I want to say that like, just kind of like a mentoring type of thing here. What I want to say is that like every time you're about to give up, you're, you're literally just about to hit whatever thing you want to do, right? So like there was a certification or, you know, finishing a course or whatever. Like every time you feel like, oh, man, I want to give up, like just just focus on pushing through that because you're just about there. Like that's that's just what I've observed over myself and others over the years is right before you're about to have like what I'll call your breakthrough on something, your your mind is like, oh, let me quit. So if you if you quit, like if anyone out there is a runner, when you start running, like your your body's like, oh, I'm gonna die, you know, like I'm about to die right now. Um, and if you just keep pushing through and you go for several minutes, eventually your body's like, well, you know, this person's not going to stop. So I guess I need to adjust and we'll, let's just keep running. That's what we're doing. Um, and eventually, you know, you get past that plateau and you, you move on and, you know, you probably still hate running um, as most people do, but you eventually get to a point where your body's like, okay, well I accept it and let's just keep going on whatever path this is. So similar thing here with learning, like anything cybersecurity or IT related, once you feel like you're at a plateau on something, either reach out to a mentor so they can give you that kick in, you know, kick in the bum or just focus yourself on like, let me just keep pushing through this, get through this module, get through this video, whatever. And that'll set me up for the next thing that I need to do or whatever. So it's really just building blocks. If you think like Legos, anything you want to do in life is a building block and you're just kind of stacking those on top of each other to build something, whatever that is. So um, don't give up. It's kind of the, that whole five minute spiel there. Uh, don't give up on whatever you're doing. Absolutely. That, that's one bit of advice that I always give the people too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Never give up. Always keep learning. Yes, yes, yes. So let's, uh, let me kick it over here to the chat and see, uh, see if anybody has some questions. Anybody have any oh, questions for uh, Mr. Thanks. Ken here? I hope they're good ones. I cannot tell you answers for either exam, but if you answer C on everything, you might have a good shot. Yeah, right? Isn't that how it <laughs> usually works? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can adjust the settings on this chat here. Do you have the chat pulled up on uh, your end? Uh, I don't see it. Let me, um, but I'm also not on your link there. So give me a second to hop in that link. No problem. You promise the link's non-malicious, sir? Uh, I can't, I can't promise anything. <laughs> I make no promises. <laughs> That's all then. Let's see. All right, cool. Uh, so I see, I actually do see one question, Zach, that just popped in the chat. Um, when did I get my CEH? Uh, I passed it um, in 2018. I want to say it was, I think it was like September, I want to say it was like September of 2018 that I passed it. Um, so my, my certs are pretty recent. Um, so yeah, September 2018, and I think I did CHFI was, uh, December when I finally passed that. 
Um, I think I took it the first time beginning of uh, December and then I passed it like two weeks later. So, um, so pretty, uh, pretty new uh, certifications. Uh, another question I see in the chat, um, I hope you don't mind me just jumping in, Zach. No, I mean, you're all good. Okay, cool. Um, another question show. I say is, uh, what's the best place to find companies who are hiring? Um, pretty much anywhere, but I, I, I think the best idea is actually to um, figure out the companies you want to work for and then go like to their websites and see if they got openings. Now, a lot of companies actually don't advertise all their openings. So another aspect, once you find like, let's say I wanted to work at, you know, Google or something like that. And I was somebody starting out. Um, it's probably a bad example because everybody wants to work at Google, I think. But uh, I would go to Google. I would check out their jobs. If I didn't see something related to myself or what I wanted, I would go on social media like LinkedIn, start connecting with Google people. Um, and then from there, I would start conversations, delivering value to them in some capacity. You're like, oh, I liked your article on this or that. I you know, I like what you talk about here, comment on the post. Um, I use a three plus three plus three uh, method to my, to basically growing social media. Um, and it's very, very successful for me. So basically what I try to do each day, um, I don't do as much anymore, but what I try to do each day is comment on three different people's um, posts. So a comment, you know, some kind of comment, like I like that, or I, you know, delivering value or something like that. Um, I also try to send three messages to people or respond to three people that are separate from those original three people. And then also uh, liking three different posts as well. So um, sometimes I combine those or whatever, but if I do that, basically what I'm doing is continuously delivering value to others. And that's all gonna come back to me eventually. So for those of you out there like looking for jobs, do it that way. Don't just go on and like connect with somebody on social media and be like, I need a job. Like that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work to get you a job. Uh, but if you connect with that person and say, hey, I liked your post on this or that, and you do that a couple of times and then you say, hey, by the way, I've been trying to get a job at that company or I've been applying to stuff. Any tips you can offer me on like interviewing or resumes or whatever, more people are more open to helping you when you do it like that than if you just come across as somebody like begging uh, for their help. So that's my advice on that. Like figure out the companies you actually want to work for, like make a list of the top, you know, 10, 20, 30 companies and then go to their websites. If they don't have a posting, start connecting with their employees on like LinkedIn and making building those relationships. And then you can go from there as like actually getting a job. Awesome. That's great advice, man. Um, I see another uh, question. When will the CEH be updated to version 10 on Cybery? Um, so I, uh, so it's basically it, a lot of the, um, without delving into, to basically violating an NDA assignment with DC council, but um, the, the version nine and version 10 are pretty, Similar content wise, there's some differences. Um, and I try to address those like in the, in the course itself that I have on ethical hacking on cybery. Um, e the thing with EC council is they continuously like update their stuff like pretty much every year. So we, I, I talk about a lot of stuff for version 10. I'm happy to answer questions on like, you know, what are some of the differences, that sort of stuff. Um, I try to address that in the course and um, especially like the live sessions I did on the CEH, um, all that there. So you really can use the course on cybery for version 10 as well, um, version 11, whatever, unless they really change stuff dramatically. But just understand that you still need to do like hands-on practice on things to be successful for the, uh, the version 10 of the exam. Um, I see another question on, are, am I thinking of OSCP? Um, I haven't lost my sanity quite yet. Um, so, uh, so OSCP is not in my pipeline, at least this year. Um, it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely something I've considered uh, but it's going to, that one's going to take some time to study for. So um, for anyone that's not familiar with the OSCP, that's kind of, that's really your entry level, like pen tester job certification, right? So like CEH, you know, the CompTIA pen test plus, um, even like the GPEN, some of those can kind of help you get, get your foot in the door. Um, but sort of the standard by like actual like hiring managers out there um, that actually know about pen testing and are hiring for pen testing. If you've got OSCP, which is, Pretty much a hands-on exam uh, that one will more realistically get you a job as kind of a junior level pen tester um, again nothing will be 100 percent of getting a job like certifications but that's one of the ones out in the industry by people that know um, about certifications and about like real pen testing that's one that will kind of get your name out there um, if you decide to take it so it's uh, so to answer the question in the short form i'm not planning that this year um, but it is one i've considered in my pipeline yeah, that one's definitely uh, very hands-on as far as taking yeah. that, that test, the, the exam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I know some people that have passed it. I know some people that have failed it um, the first time around. It's definitely a, um, 
from their from their statement is basically a, a, a really a beast. So like if I how I mentioned like CHFI was a beast earlier, uh, it does not even compare to like OSCP. Uh, OSCP is much more um, in depth uh, on stuff you'll you'll need to know how to do. Um, I see another question about books. So I'm always kind of hesitant to, well, I'm not hesitant to recommend books because I read a lot of books. And if I actually pan the camera, you see I've got a few hundred books next to me here, but um, I'm hesitant to recommend books on like pen testing just because you have to do a hands-on. Like you can't read a book and like learn these skills. Like it's not realistic. Like you can get the knowledge and go talk your way through an interview. But when somebody's like, hey, can you do this real quick in Nmap? And you're just like, uh, you know, like that, that's not going to help you. But um, some of kind of the basic books I recommend, uh, uh, we've, Zach and I talked about earlier, if you're just jumping on this, we talked about some of the basic things you should have before you try to be a pen tester. So I mentioned like Linux. Um, so one of the books I, I bought a long time ago was the Linux uh, command line. You'll see me glancing over because I'm looking at it, to make sure I get the name right. But the Linux command line, uh, I think the name is like Shots or Stocks or something like that, the author. Uh, that's one I found beneficial. Um, also, Georgia Weidman has a good like basic book on pen testing on like, Am you know, like on Amazon, you can grab um, that one walks you through a lot of the things. Some of the information in that it's an older book. So some of the information is kind of dated, um, but just take that with a grain of salt and understand like you need to research some of the more recent tools and methodologies and that sort of stuff. Um, the other one I would recommend is, of course, the Hacker's Playbook, a uh, phenomenal book, uh, as well as uh, Black Hat Python. That's another book I recommend. Um, and then also a book called Effective Python. So once you kind of learn the basics of Python, there's a book called Effective Python out there that I recommend as well. So um, again, I, I try to steer away from recommending uh, certain books because uh, I want you to get hands on. Now, if you're studying for CEH, um, I recommend Matt Walker's All-in-One uh, CEH Guide. Um, on Amazon, for most people, at least in the US, it's about like 30 or 40 bucks. Um, which is well worth it if you're going for that exam. So I definitely, if you're if you're out there and you want to take that exam, definitely buy that book off Amazon um, and and read through it because he breaks things down pretty well. Awesome. Hey, what's the biggest misconception people have about your job, Ken? In general, or like like pen testing, forensics? Or... Uh, it was just a general question that somebody. Oh, had. Okay. Um, I think the, mis the biggest misconception um, is that uh, is that it's easy to build out a course. Um, I make things look a lot easy, uh, a lot easier than they are. Um, so like people will see me like you know you know nah, because I've been doing this for so long. I've been doing this for years. Um, so for me like I can quickly like film a lab real quick or something and you know and generate a you know a quick step by step guide and walk people through it and, and all this stuff. And for me it might take you know just like an hour or something and. Uh, to do everything, including editing and stuff like that. Um, for other people, it might take them like three weeks uh, to do all that stuff. And I've been there, right? I've been there. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions on on kind of the course creation or, you know, specifically that aspect of, of what I do right now is uh, a lot of people think that like creating a course or even like your YouTube videos that you do, they think it's like you just click a, a button and you start recording and like it's all magical and everything works out and there's never technology issues. Um, and Zach and I will tell you, we had some tech issues before we, we jumped on the live here. Um, yeah. So I think that's the biggest misconception is people think it's so easy to create a, a course or a video or something like that. And it's actually, it takes a lot of work behind the scenes to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've been actually working on putting together a course for quite a long time. And it's not as easy as I think people may think it is. Um, yeah. And even for me, like who, somebody who records and edits videos like almost on a daily basis it's not easy to put together structured content properly like it's difficult yeah, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. it takes a special, yeah, it's, special it's, talent to do that yeah and especially you know staying on track um i uh i like to tell the story of like one of the first courses i ever did in my entire life online uh i it took me like over a year to do this short course um i think it was in total, like an hour long, and it was it was an absolutely terrible course. I'll, I'm I'm happy to admit that uh, audio was terrible, lighting was terrible. You know, I I was terrible as a presenter um, way back then. Uh, so uh, I think just staying on track, like I I was not on track at all. I didn't understand like you know how to set you know goals and stuff like that for like online courses. It was totally new to me. So um, just based off my experience, like just you know setting specific goals and sticking to them like no matter what i'm not you know i'm not going to sleep tonight until i finish this whatever this thing is 
um, even when you're tired, that's really what, what is going to, uh, what's going to help you. If you decide to create like an online course or like a YouTube channel or something, that's really what's going to separate you from everybody else that wants to do it. Uh, the fact that you're actually just like sticking to it and sticking to your deadlines and accomplishing those things, um, that's going to help you like actually build up whatever it is and complete whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. Um, Larry says, when you say junior level job with certain certs, what are your thoughts on a lot of jobs advertised as junior level, but still wanting three plus years of experience? Uh, one thing I say with that is never count yourself out. Um, a lot of those job descriptions out there, like they don't like hiring managers or recruiters have no clue. And actually Joe Perry and I talked about that in our intro to cybersecurity. And I find on the website, by the way, uh, we talked about that, you know, our kind of our frustration, you know, as an industry with job descriptions that, you know, um, are like, Hey, it's junior level, but we want three years experience. And we want you know you to have 47 different certifications that are all, you know, like CISP, you know, stuff that you have to like five years to get. Um, it just some of these job descriptions just say for, for Larry's question specifically, don't count yourself out just because you see something on a job description, like apply for it. The worst they can say is no, but what you do with your resume, make custom tailor to that position and highlight specific things that are in that description they're looking for. So don't focus on the experience or the certification or whatever they want. Focus on like, what are things in that job description that you know you can actually do that you've done, you know, skill wise, whatever and match up your resume to those things and highlight those things. I think that's what you actually need to focus on instead of like, oh, you know, because I, I, I did that many years ago. I was like, oh, I don't have the experience. Let me just skip over this one and go to the next one. But I soon realized that like, when you do that, like you, out of a hundred jobs, you apply to like one because that's all that's telling you like, hey, you can really have entry level experience. Um, but if you apply to all those hundred, you know, or you apply to like 20 of those, you've got a better shot of getting an interview. And then from there, you can talk your way into the actual job yeah and you know the same thing with uh with that it's just like job titles are so skewed too oh my goodness yeah it's just terrible yeah yeah um yeah touching on that real quick so if you search like if you go on like indeed or something like that and type in ceh you're going to see that ceh is listed in like analyst jobs even i've seen it like in network administrator jobs like so that's why i say like don't um you know like if you get a certification go search for wherever it's listed at and apply to like all those jobs if they interest you. Like then never limit yourself on a specific job you're applying for. Um, another trick, uh, and this was actually a trick I learned uh, uh, from uh, someone at Cybery. What they did is they basically, and this may be a joke, I don't know if it's true or not, but basically what they did is they went and searched for jobs and they went to the very last page of the job listings and applied for a job which happened to be like a job at Cybery. Um, this was way back when Cybery was you know, in, in its infancy um, so whether or not so that's a true story, I don't know, but that's actually a great idea. Once I, once I heard that, I was like, that's a genius idea. Because if you think about it, most people are applying in the first couple of pages. If you go to the last page, like there's very few applicants probably for whatever job that's listed back there. And you've got a good shot of like getting that phone call or that email, like, Hey, we want to talk to you and set up an interview. So, um, that's another kind of trick to use that maybe will work for you to, uh, hopefully get an interview and get the job. And just another mention on the job description. Um, it's something that I mention all the time. A job description is a company's wish list. They're yeah. wishing that somebody has all of those qualifications. Most of the time, nobody meets every single you know wish from that you know description. Yeah. So that's why <laughs> apply for it anyway. You know, you could meet you know thirty percent of it, and you could land an interview, and you could just blow them away based on the person that you are. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with Zach's statement there. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just a wish list and, and you'll laugh when you, when you get some experience in the industry and you look at some of these, you're like, really? Like I need CEH, OSCP, you know, CISSP. I need to have, you know, all these things and it's an entry level job, <laughs> you know, working the help desk. That doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, so yeah, it, never, never let a job description dissuade you from applying for it. Uh, Ty Green has this question here. I, he's asked it a couple times. Uh, since he's getting his master's in forensics and cybersecurity, should he still go after a forensic certification or let his master's degree do the talking? Uh, great question, because um, a lot of people have that debate. Um, I, I generally, I personally shy away from certifications unless it would be specifically applicable to like an employer you're looking for. So as an example with your master's, like let's just pretend you wanted to go work for the federal government, like FBI or something like that, 
um, having a certification in forensics might help you, you know, get the interview, whereas, you know, or get through the process, whereas somebody with just the master's in forensics might not. Um, but private sector side certification, you know, master's degree, uh, that doesn't really matter as much as like actually being able to do it. So it, it's really going to depend on the employer. Uh, before you go spend money on a certification, I would ask potential employers, like, do you want me to have this or no? Um, and if you want to do it for your personal gain, that's cool. But if they don't want you to have it, I wouldn't spend your money right off the bat trying to get it. Absolutely. That's a great answer. I'm uh, Somebody asked a question about um, uh, a roadmap, and I'm trying to look up the uh, – I have a, a bit.ly link to the CompTIA roadmap I'm trying to pull up. Um, yeah, uh, there's another um, uh, website called CyberSeek that kind of walks you through a pathway. We, we have that. Um, uh, in cyber as well with our uh, career path. So so it, let's say you were looking at the cyber side and kind of like, what should I do first? Um, if you have like no IT stuff at all, like if, you, if you've never worked as like, you know, sysadmin or networking or whatever, um, I recommend you grab one of those career paths and go through that first, get that foundational knowledge that you need. And then from there, jump into like SOC analyst. And then from there, kind of a next thing would be maybe like pen tester career path. Um, and then jumping into like cybersecurity engineer or something. And then you know, eventually like the management um, type of stuff as well. Uh, so that's that's kind of a generalized career path. It really depends on where you're at, um, you know, with your own skills. Like if you've got IT experience, uh, Shivash, then I would jump into like Security Plus as kind of an entry level cert. That's what most people do for cybersecurity stuff. Um, and if you have like no IT and any, you know, if all this is new to you, then I actually recommend you grab up like Network Plus or something to at least learn basic networking skills and then move into like security plus and try to get your first job in something. And then, you know, go on to other certifications after that. Um, experience is going to be a big factor there. So try to get that first job as, as soon as you can possibly do it. Yeah. Um, there's a question. A couple of people are curious about if you have any opinion on private sector jobs versus public sector jobs. Um, it's really about your personal goals. Uh, so if you want well, with the government shutdown and people missing their paychecks, it's kind of hard to, to, to push that avenue of it. But if you, um, if you think about government jobs, traditionally over the period of time, they're pretty stable. You know, you, you don't, for the most part with like, especially cybersecurity, since that's hot, you don't necessarily have to worry about like job security. Like you've, you know, if you work for the NSA or CIA, FBI, whatever, for, for most cases, most instances, like you've got a job, you know, until you want to retire. Um, so that's kind of the, the factor there is, you know, what do you personally want to do? Do you want kind of that job that you can work for, you know, 20 years, 30 years and then retire and get some kind of like mini pension or whatever out of that? Or do you want a job where, you know, every couple of years as you change your interest, you can switch companies and, you know, take the highest salary and, you know, and have that freedom of like moving wherever you want to in the country or the world. So it's really about you personally, what you want to do. That's my opinion on it. I prefer... Um, I personally prefer private sector because I'm former military and I hated uh, people telling me like, oh, now we're going to station you here. You know, now you got to, you got to show it up to formation at this time. You know, you got to, you got to do all these things on this checklist. You know, I, I hated that stuff personally because I hate, uh, you know, kind of losing that control or whatever. I hated that. Um, that was something I hated growing up. So I hate it as an adult too. So that's my opinion on it. Like I personally would stay private sector, um, but you know, again, that's really varied on your particular situation, what you want to do, what your family, you know, friends, you know, it's really customized to your situation. So my personal opinion, if I had a choice between the two, I would stay private sector, but other people that I know would be public sector and they are public sector um, and they stay there for 25, 30 years. Awesome. So I hope that kind of answered the, the question. Um, I see another question. I'm going to jump on real quick, Zach, uh, just post it in there. I want to work in cybersecurity. Is software engineering a degree for it? Um, so software engineering can can help you. Um, and actually, if you if that's what interests you, then uh, when you go towards more of the security side, I would focus on secure coding because that's more lucrative financially for you than like jumping into like an analyst type of role or something like that. So um, if that's your if your interest is anything around software engineering, then sure, go get a get a degree in that or, you know, practice your skills in it and then move into like secure coding. Uh, and then you'll, you know, like I said, it's financially lucrative and, and you should find it more re uh, rewarding as well if that's an area that interests you. Um, any any type of degree, like I've, 
uh, we actually got an instructor on the site, um, Sean Greer, who's got a degree in psychology. Uh, and he's, he, uh, he created the course on um, USB drop attacks. So his, his degree is in psychology, but he works as a, you know, a pen tester and some other things um, with his job. So you don't need a specific degree to get into cybersecurity uh, is probably how I'll sum up that, the answer to that question. We get people from all aspects. Some people don't have degrees, some people do. Um, it's, it's really just about you and, and kind of your drive and what you're willing to learn and the work you're willing to put into it. Absolutely. Um, I see another question. Is the DC metro area still the hottest area for cyber IT job market? Um, it depends on what you want to do in cybersecurity. So uh, the DC area is hot for like a lot of federal jobs or, you know, it's getting a lot of funding like in the Maryland part of the DC area for cybersecurity. Um, they're trying to really build that up. So I would say it's a pretty hot job market there. Also, Austin, Texas is very hot um, on cyber right now as well. Um, especially like if you've got programming background at all, that's a very hot market. Uh, traditionally, you know, your Silicon Valley um, as well. Atlanta, Georgia area is pretty hot as well. So, I mean, it just really depends on like where you live. Um, and I, I personally, well, Seattle, Washington as well. I wouldn't move someplace just because you see that the market's hot unless you have like a job offer. Like if you've got a company that's like, you know, here's a job and they're either willing to pay to relocate or they're, they, you know, you have a job then I would focus on relocating. I, because a lot of companies will do remote work these days. So you don't necessarily need to relocate your whole family or whatever, just to, just to get a job in cybersecurity. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. Sorry, I'm just trying to no. go, go along with the chat here and make sure that uh, we yeah, don't I'm miss a, anything. Yeah, I'm peeking at it too. Um, I see something else. What are the programming language required for ethical hacker? There, there actually is none um, to be a pen tester, but, um, like, it's, like we kind of talked about earlier, Python's the, the primary one that most people um, learn. But if you understand any programming language, you'll kind of understand the fundamentals. And then it's easier to learn like any other language, you know, from there. Uh, like I said, unless you're developing your own custom tools, you don't need to understand like a programming language to be a pen tester. But um, it definitely helps you, especially as you get a little more senior in your skill set. Um, you definitely want to be able to write your own stuff on the fly during a pen test. Yeah, definitely. And, and Python, I mean, God, it's used everywhere. Everybody's using Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all sorts of capacities. Um, so I think it's uh, uh, definitely a thing. Um, and being so I see a question for, so. oh, go ahead. You had a. No, I was saying, and being cross, a cross-platform language, it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. So versatile. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of the top ones, even if you don't want to be a pen tester, like just learning Python is going to help you in so many avenues. Um, you know, in life and in your career. Uh, I see another question about, can I work from home while working in cybersecurity? I kind of touched on that with uh, the mentioning of um, jobs. So yeah, you, you, you definitely can. Um, it's pretty tough to get remote work as somebody brand new, but I want to say, um, I'll actually peer, uh, plug uh, Kirsten Bra uh, Brazier. Uh, the last name is spelled B-R-A-G-E-R, -E uh, but it's pronounced Brazier. Uh, uh, she's, uh, I'm connected with her on LinkedIn, connect with her as well. She's got a book that kind of talks, it's for women, uh, women in cybersecurity that want to break into it, but it's a lot of good concepts in there. Uh, and the, one of the main concepts is think outside the box. So don't focus on a job that just says cybersecurity, but like focus on a company you want to work for remotely. Find a job they have remote. Maybe that's technical writing or or whatever the case might be. Maybe it's just customer service. Get your foot in the door. Work at that a little bit, and then bring up the idea like, hey, by the way, I'm learning cybersecurity do you guys have something remote or can we create something remote where I can kind of work on projects or whatever? Do it like that. Don't do it like, let me try to find as a brand new person, let me try to find a remote job in cybersecurity because experienced people are going to grab up those jobs. And there's very few entry. I actually haven't seen any, any entry level cybersecurity jobs that are remote. Um, most people aren't going to take that risk on. You. So try to find another avenue into the company and then bring up the idea of working remote cybersecurity for them. What do you think about CCNA versus Net Plus for cybersecurity pursuits? Um, it again, that's one of those ones that's based on your personal um, goals. Uh, you're going to learn foundational stuff with CCNA, of course, being focused on Cisco uh, devices, um, and then Network Plus, you know, being your very general stuff, uh, agnostic. Now, if your goal is to try to get a job as you're like studying cybersecurity and trying to get into this industry, then I my personal 
thing would probably be to go to for the CCNA because you'll find more job listings on that um, and get that job. And then from there, you know, transition into cyber because as a, as like a network admin, you're going to be doing security anyways, um, you know, on, on, diff, on various uh, tools. So, you know, or excuse me, appliances. So definitely I would go with CCNA if I had a choice between the two. Um, but again, it's one of those things like based off your particular thing. And that's with any certification. It's really about your personal preference and what your goals are as far as like career wise, person, you know, personal goals, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I see another questions on, on related to the CHFI and CEH, which should I do first? Definitely the CEH. Um, definitely do the CEH first. If you're going to take both of those, do the, the ethical hacking one first. Um, and that's going to help you a lot with the CHFI exam. Uh, another question on Kali Linux. So I, again, I hope you don't mind me jumping in here. Um, question on Kali Linux, you know, is it worth learning that I guess early, I guess early uh, with what you're saying there, Dan, I'm, I'm assuming you mean like, should I kind of learn Kali Linux first before I move into like actual like pen testing and that sort of stuff. And absolutely uh, learn, learn the foundational stuff, learn your way around Kali Linux. Um, so take uh, Rob, Robert Smith's course on, on the cyber estate for free, learn your way around Kali Linux, some of the different tools and that sort of stuff. And then kind of take a deeper dive into those particular tools and, and learn what you like. You know, some people like being, you know, some people like password cracking. Some people like, you know, doing Nmap. You know, some people like web attacks, you know. So figure out like what you have an interest in after you get the foundational stuff and then, you know, specialize in whatever that is. <laughs> Jeez, look at this last comment we got. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Seth Rogen and Edward Rogen. Yeah, absolutely is. Um, and, and by the way, Danny, uh, we will sign autographs. Uh, uh, I think, Zach, we decided on the price before this. What was it, a million dollars per autograph yes, or something? Uh, or? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's 50% off by the way. So yes. uh, grab your coupon while you can. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, I see another question uh, from Ty on uh, should I do CISA or security plus um, again, getting back to like, what's your specific goal, but the security plus is more of an entry level um, type of search. So if you don't have experience in any capacity, then I would do security plus and then, you know, focus on either CISA or getting a job first and then, you know, do the CISA. Um, but again, CISA is kind of entry level too. So, you know, at least in my opinion, um, so you can, for me, I would probably do either or security plus is one that's more in more job hosting. So if your goal is to, to use that, to get a job, then I would focus on security plus and then do CISA a little later on. Has Cyber incorporated a forum for users to connect? Um, so there's a, uh, so if you're a paid user, there's, there's, there's basically a Slack channel. Um, about a public Slack that, that everyone kind of communicates through and stuff like that. So, um, so if you're a paid user, yes. Uh, if you're just a free user on the site, as of right now, um, no. Uh, you kind of just have to communicate like when we do like live sessions or whatever, um, try to get on those or communicate through social media. Um, so I hope that answers the question. As, as a paid model, we have that right now. Um, with the free model, we, we don't have that right now. Awesome. Thank you. I think Larry asked that a couple times. I just wanted to follow up on that. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, I'm uh, on my end. I'm just kind of glancing back through the chat, see if I missed any questions there. Yeah, I think we got time uh, for uh, a, a couple more questions here. Cool, cool. So if you want to answer like two more and well, cool. wrap things up. Yeah. So one question I see. This is actually just on my end. I don't see it in the actual chat. Uh, who is cooler, Zach or Ken? Uh, so if you guys don't mind posting your answer to that um, <laughs> in the chat, uh, let us know. Uh, anyways. <laughs> Uh, I see a question on, can I take EC Council CEH I class? Um, I, I'm guessing you're asking about their official material. Uh, yeah, um, you can take their official material. Now, uh, one thing I'll mention on both those exams, if you don't have two years experience and, you, um, and you're not taking their official material, in most cases, you're not eligible to sit for either exam. So that's kind of the requirement, like either two years of documented cybersecurity experience or taking their official material. Um, so I, I actually had both when I uh, went to sit for the exams, but uh, I know that they've, I know actually have some students that have reached out to me on LinkedIn in the past that were actually audited by EC Council. So it, so it sounds like they do audit people uh, as far as like ex ex when you say that, hey, I've got two years experience. So, um, so if you don't have two years experience and you wanna sit for either of those exams, then you definitely will have to um, somehow get their official material. So either sign up through them or maybe like your university you're going to, maybe they have, you know, they've built into the program like I had with my master's. Um, so just kind of, you'll have to figure that out on, on your own. 
An alternate to the CEH is the CompTIA Pentest Plus. Um, so if you really just want to kind of get a similar uh, knowledge base uh, as the CEH without spending all that money with EC Council or whatever, uh, then the Pentest Plus is a, kind of an alternate that you can use um, to get a certification at a much lower cost. So again, that's an individual goal. If your, your goal is to get CEH on your resume, then of course get the CEH. But if you just care about getting like the skills and the knowledge, then Pentest Plus is a, is a very good alternative to that. What, what was your first role that you started out in? Uh, I actually started out, so I got into cyber um, on the healthcare side. So I actually started out as a nurse. Um, and I my very first role ever in the IT realm was as a, uh, it started out as, as an internship um, way back in the day. I won't, I won't tell you how old I am. Um, I want people to think I'm 20 still. Uh, I try to relive those days. But anyways, uh, uh, way back in the day, I, I scored an internship with a company in California. So I basically moved from the Midwest um, yeah, to California to relocate for this company just for an internship. Um, and I was going to stay with a relative that happened to work at this company. It's kind of how I, you know, the uh, the nepotism is kind of how I got my foot in the door there, uh, which I'm cool with uh, to do that. But I had no IT knowledge whatsoever. Like I wasn't that guy that played around with computers growing up. I was not that guy. My experience, if anyone remembers that, um, so that was the limit of my experience with computers. So basically what I did on the plane ride over is I read through a book. Um, I think it was like Sam's or, or Sands or something. It was basically those uh, teach yourself whatever skill in like 24 hours books, if you remember those. Um, so it was basically like teach yourself networking in 24 hours. Uh, and so I literally like read through this book on, on the couple hour uh, flight over and I got to the interview for my internship and I talked my way through that. Uh, and was able to actually land the in, uh, internship. And then from there, it was proving myself, right? So within two weeks, I was offered a, gen, a junior network administrator role um, with the company full time because I proved myself hands on. I kept learning. I kept jumping into projects and that sort of stuff. Um, that transitioned into like an actual network administrator role within a month. Um, and then, you know, of course, it was a dot com. So eventually that bubble burst. Um, so now I just dated myself, uh, but uh, eventually that bubble burst and that company, you know, ended up closing down and I, I reloc relocated back. But that was my first like IT role um, to get into cyber. I started out as a nurse uh, and then I transitioned kind of back into IT slash like nursing with like a EMR, electronic medical record systems. Um, so I kind of did the support and stuff like that for those that transitioned into actually like securing those and securing the, the infrastructure and that sort of stuff. Um, and then I was kind of like, well, I should, you know, I should, you know, maybe get an undergrad in, in something. And so I went back and did it and uh, started out in software engineering um, and then jumped into cybersecurity and finished out with that. And then it went back for my master's in cybersecurity as well. Um, and then uh, shortly after my master's, I actually, uh, within a week of graduating, I had landed a, a adjunct professor role um, with the university. So I was actually teaching forensics. Uh, within a couple of months after uh, graduating with my master's. So um, for those people out there that, that are like, should I, you know, will my master's degree like open doors in any capacity for me? Uh, the answer is yes, if you have specific goals, right? So if your goal is to kind of like teach or something at like a university level, it can definitely open up doors for you. So I know I digressed there a little bit, but um, my first role was as a clinician, seeing like how frustrations were with technology and stuff failing or seeing, you know, like what happened with a ransomware attack. Um, I was actually a, a clinician when the organization I was with was hit with a ransomware attack. They didn't have backups um, that were recent. Uh, so basically everything was shut down. We went back to paper for like three weeks. Uh, not cool, uh, not a fun thing to do, you know, stacks of paper and stuff like that. So um, that was kind of my first uh, or my my way of getting into cybersecurity. So uh, kind of going back to what I touched on earlier of like think outside the box. Like that was a, that's a non-traditional path, right? Like most people, they work like as a network engineer or network admin, and then they secure some things, and then they kind of move into cybersecurity and maybe as an analyst or something like that, and they you know they do it like that. Or some people start off as a programmer, and then they move into like secure coding or whatever. Um, but what you'll find is that a lot more people went the non-traditional path and like just kind of stumbled into the cybersecurity industry. Um, and those, in my opinion, those are oftentimes the best people for the industry because they think outside the box already. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, that's great, man. You had tons of great advice. 
today. I mean, I appreciate everything that you have to say. <laughs> you know, the talking about the the CHFI, the CEH, and just everything that you had to say, man. It was great. I appreciate you coming on and sharing everything with us and talking us through. And hopefully, it can get you on again to talk more and answer more questions because I think a lot of people really loved having you uh, answer the, the questions that you uh, that they had. So. That's yeah, all absolutely. that we got for you guys today. So thank you again, Ken. And you want to say your your goodbyes? Yeah, I will. I will say my cheerful goodbyes. I'm going to actually uh, answer Angel's question real quick. Uh, uh, do I have a channel where I talk in depth about my path in IT? Um, I'm actually the guy that uh, because I've I kind of hacked myself on social media. Um, I I don't like aside from LinkedIn. I don't I don't like have a YouTube channel um, though. That's actually a good idea. I should probably do that and kind of just you know, call it like a day with Ken or something like that. So keep an eye out. I may, I may decide to do that um, and talk about different, um, different things related to jobs and that sort of stuff. So uh, I will say my goodbyes now because I don't want to take up Zach's entire life. I know he's, <laughs> he's got better things to do today than uh, listen to me ramble on about IT jobs and security jobs and all that fun stuff. So uh, I appreciate everyone watching, everyone that was able to log in. Hopefully people watch the replay and stuff like that. Um, and uh, subscribe to Zach if you haven't already. Uh, also subscribe to the Cyber channel. Uh, my rap videos over there. So uh, if you're wondering, like, am I good at rapper? I'll sum it up for you. No, uh, but there's a rap video over there that that you can check out as well. So um, try to keep it. We try to keep it fun as as much as we can to Cyber. Yep. Make sure you guys check out the link in the description for Cyber. Yes. You guys can yes. uh, go join and um, check out all their all their content, all their video content for free, <laughs> absolutely free. It's a five finger discount, really. If you yes. Think about it. So. Go check them plus, out. Plus, uh, yeah, and, and plus you get a certificate of completion when you uh, when you finish Cyber courses. So uh, you can download that, put it up on your wall. Um, I'm still waiting for somebody. To, you know, I see a lot of people completing courses. I want to see the person that takes all their certification, uh, you know, or their uh, course completion certificates and puts them up on their wall as wallpaper. Uh, so uh, if that's you, if you want to be that first person, then definitely uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and send me that photo. Yeah, and make sure you guys troll. <laughs> Ken on LinkedIn too. Yes, please do. Please do. Yes. I love getting trolled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys and girls. Have a great day. All right. Thanks everyone.